Okay. All right, so the ethics of the kingdom. Um, last week I talked a little bit about the kingdom of God theme, and tonight we're going to talk about ethics. Um, certainly a very important issue this day of the days we live in. Um, but I'm not going to so much talk about all the different kinds of ethical theories within philosophy. That That's a whole topic for another time. Like if you take an ethics class in college, maybe you took an ethics introductory class to ethics or something like that. Um, you learn the different ethical theories out there. Um, this is going to probably focus a little more on the, the, uh, the ethics of the kingdom and related to the Sermon on the Mount and some other issues. So um, mostly focused on the Sermon on the Mount. But anyways, so we'll go ahead and dive in. Now, one of the best books on this topic, which I kind of got a lot of the information for the Zoom call on, came from this book, uh, Kingdom Ethics, Following Jesus in Contemporary Context. I actually got this for like three ninety nine on Kindle. It's a giant book. I have the hard copy the first edition but i saw the second edition come out on kindle and i was like i want that so that's a really really good good resource okay a lot of good stuff in that so if you want to go deeper that works um so you know we think of ethics i you know i think that some of these things probably come up hopefully in our own thinking and in other people's thinking we you know what does it mean to live a good life you know how do we live a good ethical life or what does it mean how does it live a good life who gets to define the good anyway because you can't answer that question until you define what good is um you know what about rights and responsibilities what about the language of right and wrong and of course ethics involves moral decisions you know what actions are right and wrong and if so why and of course when it comes to christian ethics you know we're talking about an approach to ethics based on christian principles of course so that's what that means of course there's secular ethics there's buddhist ethics there's islamic ethics there's jewish ethics you know i mean you could find different books um with the word ethics ethics next to it okay um no doubt about it i have a book on my shelf called on a debate called does ethics need god and it was a debate between a christian and an atheist um anyway so um, so we think of ethics, you know, it usually refers to the actions of a group, immorality of an individual, but sometimes the words are used interchangeably, right? But sometimes you might say, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what is the ethically, um, the ethical thing to do here, kind of similar. It's almost like saying, what is the moral, what is the, uh, the moral obligation here? What's the right thing to do morally? What's the ethical thing to do here? What's the you know, the right thing to do morally. Um, so sometimes those words are used interchangeably, um, no doubt about it. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, the debate, I, I, I've done enough calls on the moral argument for God. So I, I don't, if you don't remember, just go on my YouTube channel and look up some of the clips from the past. We've talked about this before, but um, I'm not going to spend the whole time talking about the same thing. But the point is, I just want to make a quick point that, you know, sometimes we might say, you know, I have, an, I have an ethical duty or I have a moral obligation to carry out a certain action because, and then, you know, we sometimes talk to people like, what is the grounding point, you know, for their ethics? What's the grounding point for the ethical duty? What What is compelling them to have this moral obligation, right? What's undergirding that, right? You know, what what's, is there any grounding point at all? You know, some people say, you know, my well, you know, my ethical duties or moral obligations come from intuition, like there's like a moral intuition, um, which means it's not it's self. it's, you know, intuitive knowledge is just self-evident, something you just know intuitively. And some people say, well, I just have this intuitive knowledge that this is the moral thing to do. Or my conscience, you know, my conscience tells me this is the thing to do um, or not to do. Um, or, you know, I, some people say their own they have their own ethical standard. You know, it's been defined by the self, by me. You know, I, I come up with my own ethical standard and you come up with yours and each to each his own, right? And then, of course, we have some people that say each society tells us what is ethical, right? I mean, different societies. I mean, some of us have similar moral codes, but 
maybe one society they be believe euthanasia is fine. You know, it's ethically permissible to have euthanasians, euthanasia in some countries, right? Not in the U.S., um, but of course, in other countries, they allow that. Or you can terminate a Down syndrome child in some countries, right? That's that's permissible in some countries. Um, just depends what country you live in. Um, or, else, or else, of course, what we say, you know, a lot of times is God determines our ethic. You know, that he undergirds our moral obligations, moral duties, um, our moral values stem from God. But we, um, you know, God is the grounding point, right? So that just comes up, obviously, when you're thinking of, you know, how to talk to people about, you know, why be good? Why be ethical, right? We always challenge them. Or we should try to challenge them, like, you know, what's your foundation for that? What What is your grounding point, right? Now, um, most Christians, I think a lot of Christians, maybe they've never heard of this, but they probably, for some Christians, they hold, there's one ethical theory. If you take a class in ethics, you know, you learn, I mean, you, you'll take, there, there's a view in ethics called divine command theory. This is one theory of ethics. There's different ethical theories, but divine command theory, um, what it says is an action behavior or choice is good because God commands it. And of course, um, it's evil. God forbids it. if it's evil, you know, it's because God forbids it. Right. So, the, you know, we just we think in divine command theory, like God's God's nature himself, his nature is the good is the grounding point. God doesn't get a standard of goodness and gives it to us. He's not, there's not like a standard of goodness above God, which he's adhering to. Then he kind of throws it our way. He is the good. His nature is good. And he's the grounding point. So the, the moral morality flows from God's nature and the good flows from his nature. So, you know, like when we, you know, say it's good to love our neighbors. It's equivalent to saying God commands us to love our neighbors. So a lot of Christians hold to some sort of divine command theory. Now there's some other Christian ethical theories out there on the table. I'm not going to go over all of them tonight, but I just want to mention that one's obviously probably permeates most Christians in some way, right? Um, anyway, now when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, you know, we're getting into ethics here for sure, no doubt about it. And in the Sermon on the Mount, of course, the backdrop of the whole Sermon on the Mount, as I talked last week a little bit about, is the kingdom theme. You know, the kingdom theme is the backdrop, okay? And of course, in the book of Matthew, we know that when Jesus comes, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist announces it. So we talked a little bit last week how kingdom can, can also be seen as like lordship rule reign or sovereignty we could say that as it's just you know synonyms for kingdom you know we obviously mean like the rule of god or the reign of god or the sovereignty of god or the lordship of, of god lordship of jesus but obviously that's the main thing one of the the largest themes throughout scripture of course that was the main thing jesus said a lot in his ministry um, one of the first things he said, right? And so we know it's in the Gospels. We know Paul mentions that phrase in other parts of his letters. And we talked a little bit last week how it's synonymous. The kingdom of God is synonymous with the kingdom of heaven. It's also synonymous with eternal life. Like if you say someone has, you say, yes, I have eternal life. You're saying I'm in the kingdom. You know, I, I, I stepped into the kingdom, into the reign of God when I came to believe and repent and receive the Messiah into my life. I, I entered into the reign of God. I entered into this eternal life. Very similar as John. John's main theme is eternal life, right? In the Gospel of John. Very same, pretty much the same thing. Um, now, of course, Jesus also said no one knows when the kingdom will, will consummate. We don't know when the end is going to happen. Jesus said he didn't even know. Um, but we need to be ready for it. But what we want to see in the Sermon on the Mount with the ethics there is this is a way of life. This is a people that have come into the kingdom coming in this life right now where they come to know Jesus. This is the characteristics that define our lives um, is we what we're doing in the kingdom of or, I'm sorry, in the uh, the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount. It's really like their practices we we attempt to practice as we prepare for the return of jesus you know as we're living our lives in this world this tension point between living in the now and living in the future we don't know when the messiah is coming back but we live in that tension point and so but we're 
called to try to practice these these uh, characteristics that are laid out in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, um, so you know instead of always trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back, since nobody knows, it could be tomorrow or next week or five hundred years from now, we need to uh, probably focus more on how we participate um, in the kingdom now, how we, you know, how this plays a role in our life and these characteristics that Jesus, of course, we invite people into the kingdom all the time, but that we, we have a certain way of living here, certain ethical, certain ethical way of living that Jesus is going to talk about. Um, now, so, you know, just to kind of summarize again, Jesus describes the kind of behavior that he expects of his disciples or his citizens of the kingdom. And we can't neglect the characteristics of the kingdom. So, you know, when the Beatitudes, you have all those blessed things we're going to talk about. Blessed are you, blessed are you. The Beatitudes affirm that we are blessed now, you know, that he promises rewards both in the present and the future, right? Who, for those of us that display these attitudes, there's future reward, but there's also blessing right now, right? Okay. Now, this is a good quote. John Drain says this. He says, Jesus' teaching was intended as a way of life only for those people who subjected their lives to God's rule. This is the point at which Jesus' ethic has been most frequently been misunderstood. People who claim to be able to accept the Sermon on the Mount, but not the claims that Jesus made about his own person, have misunderstood the essential character of Jesus' teaching. It's quite impossible to separate his theology from his ethics, and to do so destroys both. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, um, it's going to repeat, sorry. The Sermon on the Mount also, when you talk about these ethics here, as we're about to talk about, we're talking about something um, which is called virtue ethics, okay? And there is a branch of ethics. You can get all kinds of books on this, on virtue ethics, and even not related to the Bible. I mean, there's a whole, Aristotle had teachings on virtue ethics and other thinkers throughout history. Um, but in this context, we're talking about the virtue ethics in relation to the Sermon on the Mount. But, you know, think about being virtuous. You know, to be virtuous, we could say it's a person who develops specific characteristics such as goodness, honesty, self-control, moral, practical wisdom that knows the right course and knows the right course to take in any circumstance, okay? So when we practice these virtues, we develop a flourishing life. There's a lot of books and I, I was just researching tonight. There's so many books on human flourishing. They're just endless. You know, that's kind of a buzzword, human flourishing. What is human flourishing? This promotes human flourishing or that promotes human flourishing. Well, the uh, the Bible has a blueprint for human flourishing. Okay. And the, the Sermon on the Mount certainly lays out these virtues that allow us to flourish. So what's happened with, um, with Christian ethicists is they... Um, have shifted a little bit more towards virtues, these virtues, because it has to do with the formation of the character. Because they realize that if all you focus on ethics is rules, you know, laying down rules and moral principles, if you, if you don't have that kind of, if you don't have the character and the virtues there, it's not going to lead to real change, Right. Um, I mean, people can do the right thing, but not have good virtues or care. Sometimes you just, some people do the right thing no matter what, right? Or they do the wrong thing. But the point is people are virtuous or they're not virtuous, right? And so, you know, virtues are qualities of a person that makes that person a good person in community and contributes to the good of community and the good to which humans are designed. And so virtues are things that are developed, right? They're, they're character traits, they're things that we we um, have to, to cultivate, okay? And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is doing here, teaching us these virtues, okay? How to live out these kingdom characteristics, okay? Um, now, the virtues are, are listed. I'm going to go over them in greater detail, but, you know, we see in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, you know, one of the virtues is to be salt and light in the world, as we'll talk more about um matthew 5 17 to 48 discusses proper horizontal relationships matthew 6 you know sermon on the mounts matthew 5 to 7 by the way right 
And Matthew 6, 1 to 18 discusses true piety and the correct view of God. Matthew 6, 19 to 34 discusses possessions. And Matthew 7, 1 to 12 discusses condemnation, discernment, judging. But we'll talk about these virtues in greater length. Now, um, the Beatitudes describe the new community to identify believers with Jesus. So Jesus forms this new community, right? He forms this kingdom community. And when someone comes to know him, we come part, we become part of that community. And each beatitude as we see describes the new community in Jesus from a different perspective. And so you'll see different behavioral standards for the community. These different um, characteristics are laid out. Um, so, I think that, you know, like I said, for now, as I said last week, we when we, we try to carry out these kingdom ethics in this world, we attempt to do that. What we're doing is that's, that's part of us trying to give people a taste of the reign of God in this life now. I talked about this last week. The, the kingdom is future, too. Jesus is coming. He's going to reign on earth. Um, but we live in that tension point, And for now, you know, we try to give people a little taste of what that's like in our relationships with people, in our work in this world. You know, we're agents of deliverance, we're agents of redemption. Um, wherever we are, whatever industry we're in, you know, we're trying to show people a little bit of the reign of God now, what it looks like, right? A little sliver of that. Now, oops, second here. There we go. Okay. So let's talk about some of these uh, blessed uh, sayings. Now, when Jesus says he's going to start saying the blessed, you know, blessed are you, blessed are you going through these blessed teachings. Um, you know, we want to think that when you think of the word blessed, um, you know, you might want to think of the wide semantic range it has, such as fortunate, happy, enlarged, or lengthy. Um, when Jesus is using the term blessed in the Beatitudes, he's talking about a a state or a um, a uh, the a state of well being, you know, a deep filled contentment in God that cannot be shaken um, by poverty, grief, famine, persecution, war, any tragedy. Right? It's this contentment we have in God. Um, but he's saying that when he goes over these things, he says, "Blessed are you," and he's talking about how enlarged are you, how fortunate you are, how happy you will be, okay, um, if you do these things. Now, first one, when he talks about blessed are the poor in spirit, um, that uh, so if you think of the way it's that that's phrased from the from the Hebrew, it can mean economically poor and spiritually humble. So. When Jesus talked about blessed are the poor in spirit, there's certainly people around him that were destitute. Um, of course, a lot of them had major uh, diseases. We know that he healed a lot of leprosy. Leprosy was one of the main diseases at that time. These people are suffering from disease, suffering economically under the Roman rule, um, suffering from other issues. Um, so definitely... The poor can be defined, you know, as powerless, needy, humble, lowly, pious, right? Um, but it also can consist of this being the, the spiritual broken, the, the spiritual brokenness, the one who's spiritually broken or spiritually humble, right? Someone who's realizes when they look at the majesty of God and his greatness, how small they really are, right? And we know that nobody comes to faith in Jesus, no one becomes a Christian without seeing their poverty before God. Unless they're poor in spirit, they don't get saved, right? The arrogant in spirit, the haughty in spirit do not come to know Jesus. They don't get into the kingdom, right? So, like I said, it's a little, it can be both. It can be economically poor and it can do with your spiritual humility before God. Um, you know, you could see that you know, Jesus is teaching that the spiritually humble, those that pray humbly without making any claims of being better than others, are the ones who participate in God's reign, right? Um, and this the focus on the one who's poor in spirit is not on their is is not on his own humility or virtue, but on God's grace and compassion. Okay. 
You know, there's that passage in Isaiah 57, 15, where God says, I will dwell with those who are contrite and humble in spirit and revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite. And that's who God's looking for. He's looking for those kinds of people um, in this world. They're, they're out there, but there's certainly plenty of those who are arrogant in spirit, as we know. And we know that um, those people need to be humbled, and sometimes God will allow things in their lives to humble them. But that's an attitude we have. We recognize our own spiritual poverty before God, constantly realize how much God's grace um, just is what upholds us on a daily basis, right? His grace and compassion. Now, when Jesus says, you know, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted, um, you know, mourning like poor in spirit has a little bit of a double meaning. Um, it can mean grief, such as the sadness of those who lost someone they care about deeply. Um, it can also mean repentance. Um, sinners who mourn over their own sins and the sin of their community, right? And want the sin to end and they want to serve God. So it can be a double meaning, okay? Um, you know, we, when we are obviously hopefully in our Christian lives, you know, we're always repenting. I mean, we're always constantly, hopefully seeing our own sins and confessing our sins. And, you know, we can confess the sins of a community um, of, you know, sins of others, you know, that's, you can say, Lord, we failed in this area as a church and we agree with you about that. But the point is it's an attitude, right? It's a mourning. It's a, it's an attitude. Um, now, when he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Um, some translations, of course, say humble or giant. Gentle, I'm sorry, humble or gentle. You, know, you could say, blessed are the humble or blessed are the gentle. For they shall inherit the, the earth. Of course, there's been challenges with the English word meek translated there. Because obviously, sometimes that comes across as harmless or spiritless, kind of like a doormat. If you think about a meek person, it's thought of like someone who is a bit of a doormat. And some people view Jesus as, you know, when he teaches this, he's just this very, very meek, kind of a harmless, um, you know, kind of just a Barney the Dinosaur figure. You know, he doesn't have any backbone. He doesn't have any truth in him. He's just kind of this, you know, just very, very kind of weak, messianic person. Now, Jesus was certainly humble um, and gentle, but... When you look at the word, um, the way the better the way it's translated, when it, you you know you look it up like in the Old Testament, the way it's used, um, if you you know you translate it differently, I mean you know not use the word meek. I mean the word for meek, you know, in Hebrew. But um, if you look at Moses and Jesus, you know that that doesn't really come to mind. Someone that's harmless or spiritless. Obviously Moses was very strong, of course, in what he did in Egypt, you know, after obviously going up against Pharaoh, of course, God equipping him to do that. And of course, Jesus having to do what he did. You know, these were not harmless or spiritless people. They weren't doormats. Okay. Um, you know, Jesus is quoting here Psalm 37, 11, and it comes out of Isaiah 61, 1, the same Hebrew word for humble that we saw in Isaiah 61, 1. But, you know, humble means being someone who's totally surrendered to God, okay? Um, someone who has, social, you know, socially and economically, I am sorry, I'm trying to get my screen to move here. Um, it's not moving. Okay. Well, anyway, someone who's totally surrendered to God. I can't quite see the bottom of my screen, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, so also when it says um, they shall inherit the earth, you notice that there? Um, some translations say a better translation is land. Um, the word earth is arets. Um, I'm sorry, the, the earth is a better translation. I'm sorry, land is a better translation, I'm trying to think. Um, the point is that the Jews at that time would have understood um, that Jesus is talking about they inherit the land of Israel. Okay, that's what he would be referring to. Blessed are the 
humble for they shall inherit the land. And the land was the surrounding Israel. Of course, the Jews were not living. They were living under Roman rule at the time. But he's talking about a blessing that comes. They shall inherit that land. The land promises, by the way. That's another way of looking at that. There we go. Okay. Humble in the sense of being surrendered to God on the bottom there. Yes. If we are poor and surrendered to God, we are blessed because Jesus is delivering us. We shall inherit the uh, the earth. Okay. Um, now, it talks about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. Um, some people think of righteousness like the way Paul teaches it. Different different things are going on there. Um, when Paul talks about righteousness, like in his letters, in this context in Matthew 5, um, it has to do with the covenantal aspect of righteousness that, you know, it's about preserving the peace and wholeness of community. So righteousness in the Old Testament is about preserve. it refers to like preserving the shalom or the peace of the community, the wholeness of the community. Once again, Jesus is referring back to Isaiah 61. Um, it's it's the opposite of somebody who's alienated and oppressed from the community. It's restoring and preserving peace and wholeness in that community. It's bringing people back into that. Um, we It's an issue of deliverance and restoring people to covenant community, okay? So it's not just about your personal righteousness necessarily. Um, it's more seen in a community sense. So, you know, as I say here, the ethical norm for righteousness is not a philosophical definition, but the character of God. So Yahweh's character is su seen supremely in delivering the people from the oppression of Pharaoh in Egypt into the covenant community of the promised land. It may be that only those readers who experience injustice, hunger, and exclusion from the community can fully experience the significance of what the Bible means by justice. So the theme of deliverance that we've seen in Jesus's extensive references, the Isaiah 61 deliverance passages that proclaim the theme of deliverance is, is seen there. Okay. So righteousness has a lot to do with justice and has a lot to do with restoration, has a lot to do with restore, rest, uh, restoring people to community. Uh, it isn't just your own personal righteousness, like um, whether you're right, whether the we talk about the righteousness of Jesus covers us, you know, where God sees Jesus as righteousness. That's that's a different. That's more in Paul's thought. It's a little different here. Now, when Jesus talks about mercy, blessed are the merciful; um, they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. He talks about mercy. Um, when he talks about merciful, um. So the, the the way that's translated is it means generous and doing good deeds of deliverance. So it's definitely an action. It's a an action that delivers someone from need or bondage. And we know that in the Gospels, of course, mercy can mean forgiveness that delivers people from the bondage of guilt. It can be deliverance from the bondage of a disease. Um, as Jesus delivers people out of exert out of being afflicted by Satan or afflicted by leprosy or something, there's a sense of healing or forgiving. Um, so we are commanded to show mercy, mercy, of course, God is merciful. So we are um, hopefully, you know, that's that's the goal to this. It is an action. OK, of course, you know, when we show mercy to people, sharing the gospel is an act of mercy, because, of course, that delivers somebody out of their spiritual bondage, um, helping someone financially, helping someone in need, whatever it can be, can be an act of mercy, um, delivering someone from some kind of bondage, you know, whether it be helping them to get help if they have an addiction, that can be a form of mercy. There's all kinds of ways to practice mercy. But Jesus said in Matthew 23, 20, I'm sorry, 23, 23 to the Pharisees, you know, he said, justy, mercy, mercy and faith, those are the weightier matters of the law, which were neglect, which they were neglecting. So mercy made the list there, right? Justy, justice, mercy and faith. 
Um, and just like, you know, Jesus said, just the way we've been show mercy, like the first disciples, we show mercy. People that aren't very merciful to others don't understand the mercy God has shown them, right? Sometimes we just want to get back at people, right? And show vengeance. But that's not going to work because vengeance is for God alone. And we are, we lead people to God. You know, we lead, we turn people over to God. So we are commanded to do mercy. When Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see the kingdom of God. Um, obviously, we are called to give ourselves to God, uh, you know, an all-encompassing orientation toward God, a whole, full heart devotion to God. Because the heart in the Bible is in uh, Levad in Cardia, um, it occurs over 1,000 times in the Bible, right? The word heart, it's the most common anthropological term in the Bible. But it's all of you. The heart is your totality of who you are. In the Bible, it it's your intellect, it's your emotion, it's your will, it's everything you have to love God with, right? So the biblical authors would say the heart thinks, remembers, reflects, meditates, right? Um, obviously not your literal heart, but the heart is everything you have, right? And so Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. And so what he's what he's saying is that there's not like a split between like your outward actions and the inner heart. There's like one whole self in relation to God. So the heart is like the relational organ. So when you sin against somebody, you obviously... It starts in your heart, right? That sin begins to stew in your heart, and then you act on it, right? So you can say your inner heart is developing that thing you're going to do or not do, and then your outward action is going to be carried out or not, right? But they, they go together. Um, there's not really a real split between the inner and outer in the Bible. There's just really God serving and idol serving. That's what it is. You either serve idols or you serve God. So the pure in heart has a pure-hearted devotion to God, okay? First devotion to God, everything, a full devotion to God. And those people will be blessed. Another ethic or virtue to um, focus on is blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called children of God. Um, the peacemakers in scriptures, of course, are those that bring reconciliation to broken relationships. We are shalom makers. That's a Hebrew word for peace. It means wholeness or completeness. We're obviously, you know, we're called to bring shalom to human relationships. Um, there's there's heal, there's restoration and reconciliation between nations, of course, as well between God and man. Um, but, you know, there is a sense of peace referring to rest and tranquility as far as from the Greek perspective. So, yeah, we're called to be shalom makers. We should be able to step into situations and be known as peacemakers, not dividers and not um, haters and not. Uh, hopefully we're not people that are characterized by tons of broken relationships and causing broken relationships and just being problems. Um, I hope that we're characterized as being peacemakers. Now, that doesn't mean we have to agree with everybody or everything. It, that's not the way life works. But overall, we should be w looking for ways to bring reconciliation, if it's possible. Not always possible, but we sure can try. Now, remember at that time, that Jesus um, had another group around him called the Zealots, and they were the revolutionaries who want to take over Rome by force. They were the kind of like the ones that were the violent ones, right? They wanted to start these revolts. And of course, Jesus said, that's not the way it's going to get done. He says, you're not going to take over Rome. You're not going to get anything accomplished by trying to destroy Rome, your enemy. Of course, then he goes on to say, tells them about forgiving their enemies. Um, but anyway, so... Hopefully we're known as peacemakers and hopefully people come to us to help them with relationships with other people. And hopefully we have some good suggestions, right? From a biblical perspective. 
And then when he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for the righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others are vile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for they should persecute the prophets who are before you. So persecution is a, um, is a mark of a believer. I mean, I'm saying our Christian life is not going to be necessarily marked by no persecution. People will misunderstand us. They will revile us. Um, there's brothers and sisters, of course, over in other countries getting killed for their faith. So we don't really hit, don't really get a ton of persecution over here in the States. Maybe I know some of you are a couple other countries, but we don't get any heavy persecution here. I mean, yeah, we get some things push back on speech issues, maybe some other issues, but nobody's, our lives aren't being threatened nonstop and we're not being butchered or killed by, you know, by others. Um, but, you know, the context is to understand the prophets. The prophets were persecuted. Jesus was persecuted as the ultimate prophet. And we obviously can't please everybody and follow Jesus. We can't be politically correct. Um, there's a lot of Christians who want to be politically correct. Um, we need to be willing to suffer as Jesus suffered. And we follow in his footsteps. And, you know, that's part of our reward. And that's part of being a believer. Um kind of basic christianity 101 if you want to be a christian just you need to be if everyone likes you and says nothing about you at all and they simply um i'm not saying to be a jerk for jesus but i mean if you know if 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 nobody is trying to push back on you on anything then maybe you're not maybe you're not speaking enough truth or maybe you're just not you're you're trying too hard to be liked okay now, like I said, I'm not saying be a jerk for Jesus, use wisdom, but sometimes I think we're more interested in being politically correct sometimes. Then he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp. And put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and gives light to in all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, so they may see your good deeds and give honor to your Father in heaven. So there's no doubt that salt and light are something we're called to be. He says we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. It doesn't say you you kind of are. He says you are. So we're called to be an alternative community, not conform to this world, right? And we don't, being a light means we don't withdraw from the world. We engage the world. We go into dark places, places of darkness, places of, places that are oppressed, places that are spiritually oppressed, places that don't, aren't always comfortable, but we're called to be a light there. And then he talks about your deeds. Let your light, let your deeds shine. You let your good work shine so that they, they, they give honor to your father in heaven. So, you know, people do see the kingdom community through our actions, of course, no doubt about it. Um, you know, salt in the, um, in the Old Testament is associated with purity, uh, covenantal loyalty, an element to be added to sacrifices, as well as a seasoning for food, just to get the wide range there. And then when he talks about tasteless, you know, becoming tasteless just means to become foolish. It's very similar to the wisdom that Jesus talks about, Matthew 7, about those who built their house on the sand or on the foundation. The foolish builder built his house on the sand. Um, you know, the emphasis is on do the deeds of Jesus, do what Jesus says, have him as your foundation, you will have a solid foundation, right? But if we lose our saltiness, it means we're losing our identity that distinguishes us from the rest of the world, right? And we don't want to be more like the world. We don't want to be conformed to the world. We want to be different. We want to be salty. And so the goal is when we're around people that are not Christians to try to be salty, whether in a, maybe in a surrounding of people that don't believe what we believe, a social setting, or just friends or family. Sometimes it's easy to get sucked into their language, sucked into their beliefs, and we have to try to be stay salty, try to be different, right? Try to be a preservative there. Try to rub off on them, 
Not so much that they rub off on us, but rub off on them. That's the goal. And then, of course, we know with the light thing that God is identified as light. We know that Israel is called to be a light to the nations. And, of course, God's word is light. And when Jesus is saying this teaching about you are the light of the world, the background that the Jews would have thought of most likely is from um, Isaiah 2, which talks about when it says it shall come to pass in the latter days, the mountain, the house of the Lord shall be established at the highest of the mountains and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. And he teaches his ways and that we may walk in his past out of Zion shall go to the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, you know, it's, it's a reference to Israel being that light, you know, that they will point other nations to the, to the light. Um, you know, people want to be learning from the house of Israel or be learn from, um, you know, what's going on in Jerusalem there. So Israel was called to be a light for sure. People are supposed to be drawn to Israel. They didn't obviously always fulfill that perfectly. Um, but you know, that's, that's the goal. And now we're salt and light as well. We're the light of the world as believers of Jesus. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the background of Isaiah 2, 2 to 5, disciples are a city on a hill. Only if we invite and draw people of all nations up to the hill and through the gates into a new community. That's probably the background there. Jesus is referring to the city on a hill in Matthew 5, 14. Um, that's what I was referring to, the city on the hill with that background there, that scripture. Um Yeah, once again, that obviously doing good deeds um being salt and light is directly related to action you know doing good deeds so those two go together as well um okay so in matthew 5 8 we saw it talks about blessed are the pure in heart um, you can read the Old Testament scripture backgrounds for that in Psalm 24, 3 to 4, Psalm 73, 1, which speaks of clean hands and a pure heart. Um, shall see God, when Jesus says they shall see God, make obviously the goal is to make every effort to live in peace with everyone, to be holy. Without holy, holiness, no one will see the Lord. Very similar to Hebrews 12, 14. Um, and then the throne of God of the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no night. A little bit about the light there. Then um, in Matthew 5, 21 to 26, a couple, few more things. Jesus talks about being angry. Um, you know, about the issues of being angry. And he says here, I just got to pull it up here because I don't, fortunately, I've been doing this without my scripture right in front of me. Yeah, Matthew 5.22. Well, he says in Matthew um, 21, you've heard, heard that it was said in all generation, do not murder. Whoever murders shall be subjected to judgment. But I say to you, every who is angry with their brother will be subjected to judgment. Um, and whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council, or whoever says fool will be sent to the fiery hell. So I'm not going to, I'm just talking about anger here for a little bit. Um, obviously, you know, there is a place in the Bible for righteous anger. I don't want to say there's not. Ephesians 4.26 talks about that. But Jesus is talking about a kind of anger that is the sinful kind of anger. Um, the kind that is a, is a, can lead to a cycle that we're stuck in, an ongoing action. Um, the kind that is really a bitter kind of anger and a destructive kind of anger, and that's the one Jesus is speaking against. So he talks about some of these transforming initiatives that deliver us from sinful anger and killing, because anger and killing can go together. Now, murder in the Bible, of course, is hating someone in your heart. Um, you can you can murder someone in your own heart, by the way. It's not just physical death, right? So the goal is to transform the relationship from anger to peacemaking, right? To transform enemies to friends. 
So Jesus is trying to emphasize. And the goal is always to hopefully to have some conflict resolution. The reason relationships go astray and things don't get worked out because both either one of them or both of them just don't have any conflict resolution skills. I've seen it happen many times. Um, never learned any conflict resolution skills. Um, conflict happens. They just don't know what to do. Don't know just simply the relationship just ends or they just don't talk to each other anymore because they simply don't know how to deal with it. There's nothing wrong with having a disagreement or having some conflict. The issue is how you resolve it. So if you can resolve it and have tools to resolve it biblically, then you'll be fine. Um, but, you know, you want to think about a transforming initiative here. It's more effective to not simply criticize when someone does something wrong, but to model and teach and practice together. The new pattern replaces the wrong pattern. Something to think about there. Now, Matthew 5, 27 to 30, of course, Jesus then talks about adultery. Um, he talks here about um in verse 27, you heard it said it was not, it was, I'm not going, I'm skipping a couple of things, by the way. It says in verse 27, you've heard it say, it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if it looks at a woman, desire for her has already committed adultery within his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one member of your body to have your whole body be thrown into your hell. And then if you look, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members and have your whole body go into the hell. So Jesus is using some serious hyperbole to talk about sexual issues, um, to talk about idolatry. I'm sorry, adultery in your heart. Um, you know, and it is very serious. Of course, you know, sexual attraction is part of human existence. Um you know, God makes beautiful people, and sometimes we're drawn to physical beauty and inner beauty, and that's that's fine. Um, that's the way God has made us. We can acknowledge someone's a beautiful person. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, the challenge is obviously always when when it goes further than it should in our minds, and obviously when appreciation for beauty turns into uh, adulterous thoughts, right? So obviously it starts in our thought lives. Um, so that's why we have to renew our minds in scripture constantly and be alert, sober-minded, ready, alert, right? And be aware of what we're seeing, be aware of what's around you. Um, we don't live in the most modest culture anymore, if you may have noticed. Um, talk to me about it. I'm on a college campus. <laughs> but, um, you know, we need to be careful. And adultery certainly can come from a lonely heart. No doubt about it. Um, you know, I'm not getting my needs met. So, you know, I'll go ahead and get my needs met my way. Of course, you know, then that leads to bad things. Um, uh, Jesus also mentions divorce in Matthew 31. I'm sorry, 531. He says, it was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her legal document. But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except for immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So uh, Jesus talks about where divorce is permissible. He's going from Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 2. Um, obviously, grounds of immorality or unchastity or adultery, obviously, is the grounds. Um and then he talks, he says her divorcing husband causes the divorced wife to commit adultery when she remarries. Um, the new husband is also an adultery when he marries the divorced woman. So this has led to a whole lot of debate in the church, a whole lot of debate about divorce and remarriage. And I'm not going to be able to spend the whole, I guess we could just do the whole Zoom call on that. Um, but instead, I'm going to give you the four different views. So there's a great book, Divorce and Remarriage, Four Christian Views. Can you believe it? A four views Christian book on that topic. How shocking. Um, but you can get that. It was edited by Wayne House. There's four different views in this book. And, um, you know, it gives four different views. You know, there's the, the traditional view or the one common Christians must never divorce and never remarry. Um, that's one of them. Uh, or divorce is permissible for adultery and a desertion, but remarriage is not permissible. Um, number three, divorce is permissible for adultery and desertion. Remarriage is permissible for the innocent party. 
Number four, divorce is permissible for adultery, desertion, abuse, um, and in other special circumstances, and remarriage is, is permissible for the innocent, those who have been repentant. So those are the kind of four different views that are on the table these days on divorce and remarriage. Um, I know Christians will differ. I know pastors will differ. I know that some pastors take a very hard stance on it. Um, there's some Christians that don't even look into it. Some Christians just like, hey, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm I'm getting remarried, you know, and they don't really think about it. Um, I don't know the situation. I'm not passing judgment anyone. I'm just saying that I know there's a lot of remarried people in the church who have been divorced. I don't know all the issues. I don't. Um, but there certainly is a lot of remarriage that uh, happens or has happened and is happening. Um, but anyway, I encourage you to get that book and read hard, study hard. Okay. Um, and then Jesus talks about in verse 33 to 37, the vows issue. He says here, and you heard it say to you, to an older generation, do not break an oath, but fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, do not take oaths at all, not by heaven, because of the throne of God, not by earth, because it is footstool, not by Jerusalem, because the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, because you are not able to make one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes and no, no, for more than this is from the evil one. So Jesus talks here about the vows, the, the pledges before God we take and in God's honor. Um, that some item or act is forbidden or required of him or her. And of course, the oaths, you know, we communicate sacred oaths to communicate our truthfulness can be counted on. And of course, truth tell telling is a huge part of the breaking into the kingdom of God. It's a part of the virtues. Um, Jesus is warning about, you know, being falling into a pattern of deceit because it goes right back to Satan because Satan is the father of all lies. So, there's a lot to say there about our words and the the pledges we take and the oaths that we say or the oaths that we take as well um, and the oaths we make. Um, so let me move on to um, Matthew. Um, so, uh, well, if you go to Matthew 6, I don't have time to go through all of Matthew 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus of course, teaches on the disciples' prayer, as you know. He talks about fasting. He talks about not being worried, not being anxious. Um, you know, each day have, has enough trouble trouble of its own. They come to him and ask him how to pray. He teaches them the disciples' prayer. I know we call it the Lord's Prayer. It can be called the disciples' prayer. Um, but then he he moves on to um, to Matthew 7. And then at the beginning of Matthew 7, of course, we have that passage where people get confused about where it says, judge not lest you be judged. And then people take it right out of context, which leads to problems, because all you have to do is read it in context, Matthew 7, 1 to 5. Um, you know, when Jesus talks about judging, he's talking about the right way to judge. He's giving you advice. He's giving us teaching on how to judge. He's not saying you can't judge. He's saying this is how you judge. He's saying you don't you don't judge someone if you're you don't hold someone to a standard, of course, if you're not meeting that standard. Right. So if you're saying, hey, you shouldn't cuss, you're cussing and then you're cussing all the time, then obviously you're you're not you really can't make that judgment. Right. You can't hold someone to a standard. You're not meeting yourself. Um, and. Obviously, we make a million judgments a day. Not a million, but we make hundreds of judgments every day. Um, you can't live without making judgments. That's just the way life works. So he's not saying you can't make a judgment. Um, it's just how you make the judgment, right? And of course, you know, when we, some people get really judgmental because they think it makes themselves look better. Some people, you know, like to build themselves up, put other people down and think, oh, I can just talk about how self-righteous I am and what a great Christian I am. And that person isn't meeting the standard, but I'm meeting the standard and I'll go ahead and talk about how bad they are. Um, that that's not the way you judge. Um, but you know, Jesus talks about taking the log out of our own eye first before we judge, you know, examine yourself, make sure you're not passing judgment on something or someone without taking the log out of your own eye. And 
Make sure you're not judging without the correct information. A lot of times we pass judgment too quickly. We don't have all the information, right? We say, oh, I bet that's what happened there. And I can't believe that person did that. But then you don't even know the situation, don't know the circumstances, right? <laughs> so there is a way to judge. It's just you have to follow Jesus's guidelines there, okay? Um, but most people think that Judging today means that you have to, the way it works today, you have to affirm every behavior. If you don't affirm someone's behavior, then you're, you're judgmental, right? If you don't agree that I want to live my life as a trans person and I want to go off and mutilate my body and I want to compete in men's sports and I'm a woman or I'm a man that wants to compete in women's sports and men going in women's locker rooms, if you don't agree with that, you're judgmental and you're not inclusive and you're not intolerant and you're mean and you're you're not being compassionate. Um, that is not what Jesus teaches. Okay. It's not what he's saying. Um, we can make judgments and we can say that's morally wrong. Okay. That is morally wrong. And I don't have to agree with it. Okay. I can love you still, but the behavior I'm not going to agree with. Okay. Um, just like all kinds of behaviors. I mean, as a parent, do you affirm all your children's behaviors? I doubt it. I hope not. Um, so people get way, way off track on that judging thing. And Christians are really falling into the cultural traps these days because they don't want to say anything ever now. They're just, I don't want to say anything. People think I'm judgmental. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to, I don't want to come across as con condemning or whatever. I'm just, I just won't say anything. People are going to do what they're going to do. And I'm just going to sit over here and not going to say anything. So the end of the day, Yes, God is the ultimate judge. He will judge. But it doesn't mean you can't make any judgments. It's not what he's saying. Okay. Um, you know, there's that passage in 2 Corinthians, or is it 1 Corinthians 5, the one where the guy is, uh, the sin in Corinth, um, where the guy is caught in that sexual sin. And then Paul says, he said, I delivered this person over to Satan. <laughs> I mean, so you are going to deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. I mean, can you imagine someone saying that in a church today? Walk in. Yeah, that person's in sin. Let's deliver them over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. I mean, if that was Paul today, he'd be viewed as the most judgmental, mean spirited believer ever. I could just guarantee it. People say, did he just say that? I can't believe he said that. That's, that's harsh. <laughs> I I like to see Paul today. He, Paul would be a riot to see what he'd be like today in churches. Um, yeah. So let's not, hopefully we'll get that, not get too confused on that. So there's no authentic, um, oh, and then Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Let me just read that real quick. Matthew 7, I'm sorry. Matthew 7. So. Twenty one to twenty three, he says, not oh yeah. Then he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do powerful deeds in your name? Then I'll declare them. I never knew you. Go away from me, lawbreakers. So obviously, only God knows those who are His. God only knows those who are truly born again. Um, there's going to be people. There's always people that can do outwardly all kinds of things that look like the real deal. Um, but inwardly, they're not really in the faith, obviously. Um, and only God knows that, obviously. We can't tell sometimes. I mean, someone could be doing all kinds of things in the name of Jesus. We don't know. Um, but Jesus will give warnings here that obviously there will be, will be people that look like they are the real deal, but they're not. Um and, you know, the goal is that, of course, we want to train people in authentic Christianity. Um, we want to teach them authentic discipleship. That's the goal. But obviously, you know, it's going to be hard to tell sometimes because, you know, people can outwardly do all kinds of things in the name of Jesus. But good, the good news is Jesus knows who's the real deal. Um, that's up to him. So. Let's just uh, recap the vir the virtues. I talked about the virtues at the beginning of the call, virtue ethics, because that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, 
the Beatitudes teach we are humble before God and identify with the humble, the poor, and the outcasts. We mourn with sincere repentance toward God and comfort others who mourn. Secondly, we're surrendered to God, committing ourselves to following God's way, making peace, hunger, and thirst for delivering community, restoring justice. We practice compassion and action, covenant faithfulness towards those in need. We seek God's will with holistic integrity in all we are to do. We make peace with our enemies as God shows love to enemies. We're willing to suffer just as Jesus suffered because of our loyalty to Jesus and justice. That's why I talk about being persecuted for his name's sake. And it's interesting that if you look at Jesus's virtues, the virtues Jesus taught and compare them with Paul and his letters, um, there's a lot of similarities. Um, there's virtues mentioned by Paul at least twice. The virtues mentioned by Paul at least twice in his letters are love, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, unity, peace, joy, righteousness, forgiveness, and endurance. Um, a lot of those things are very similar to what Jesus taught. Not a lot of difference. Um, Paul's virtues of tolerance, unity, and patience, along with peacemaking, the church has matched the virtue of peacemaking, the Beatitudes. So, you know, people try to pit Jesus and Paul against each other, and that's a real mistake. They're very much on the same page, even though we know, as far as you know, Paul wasn't one of Jesus's original disciples. He didn't travel with Jesus. He found about Jesus later on, and we know that then he encountered the other apostles and hung out with them. So, but there is a lot of similarity here. Um. All right. Well, that's about all I have for ethics of the kingdom. Um, obviously, I recommend going back to the beginning. If you want to get that book, Kingdom Ethics, as I mentioned at the beginning, that would be a really, really good, uh, good book to get if you want to go deeper on this topic. Kingdom Ethics right there. So those are the goals. Not all of us can live by these these ethics, obviously. Not all of us can hit these virtues, but it's certainly something we strive towards as we live in the realm of the kingdom. Then we, we await for the king's return. Amen to that. I'll stop there. Oops. Not working there. Oh, I know what I have to do. Sorry.